worship. Praise God. Good to see everybody this morning. Good to see everybody on this beautiful Monday, Monday morning, our indoor version. <laughs> For those who just joined us, we're indoors until further notice, until the smoke clears in California for all the fires. We've been recommend, highly recommended to stay indoors as much as possible while the fires from the north are blowing to the south. So until further notice, we'll be indoors in our worship and praise until the air cleans up and we can, can breathe again. <laughs> right now, it smells like smoke, and they're telling us at some point, it will taste like smoke. Remember last year, last year we had all those fires. I told you the sun was orange at noonday, and you walk outside, and you could taste the smoke. And when you can taste the smoke, uh, definitely stay inside. Because if you can taste it, that means that's how much you're breathing. So we just pray the wind, uh, supposedly supposedly the wind is going to shift this weekend and blow the smoke out into the ocean. But right now, it's heading to, Cali heading to Los Angeles from the Northern California. So we say, just keep us covered. And Lord, protect our lungs and protect everyone to protect everyone in line of this devastating smoke that's affecting so many people and people losing homes. And we, we just pray, as always, we pray for everyone anywhere who's dealing with any kind of disaster, hurricanes, floods, earthquakes. We know what's coming. The, the Bible always talks about it. The, we know that the Bible talks about increases of earthquakes and pestilences and things going around. So we really know, we really know what's going on right now. There's, there's all kinds of warnings going on about how close we're getting to the end times. So we're not surprised. Those of us who follow Christ, we are not surprised about all the stuff that's going on right now in the world. Because the Bible already tells you. Already tells us what's going on. So our main focus is to what? Just stay focused and get closer and closer to the Lord and be ready. People get ready. There's a train coming. You don't need a ticket. You just get on board. The train to salvation is coming. So be ready. Be ready. Get your ticket now. Get your ticket now. And you won't have to worry about it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Our Today's lesson, actually, I've talked about this title, but I've never said, I've never given a lesson on this title. God will get your attention. Today's lesson, God will get your attention. Now, I've, I've, I've done... I've used that phrase in many lessons so many times that I thought I actually did a lesson about the phrase until last night I put it in Google and YouTube search and realized I always say this phrase. I've given examples of the phrase, but I've never done a lesson on God will get your attention. See, sometimes, sometimes things we're going through in life, God needs to get our attention because either we're walking the wrong walk, we're doing something we shouldn't be doing, we're on the wrong road. Sometimes we're on the wrong road and don't even understand it. So sometimes God has to get your attention to bring you back to where you're supposed to be, to make you wake up, to make you wake up and say, wait a minute, what am I doing? Lord, what am I doing? Sometimes he gives you a wake-up call. And the wake-up call is for you to say, Lord, what am I not doing right? Lord, what am I doing? And then he answers you and tells you what you're supposed to be doing through the Holy Spirit. So God will get your attention. God will get your attention. And sometimes, sometimes it's tough love. Ooh. Sometimes it's tough love. Sometimes you go through some things and you say, man, this is tough. It's tough love. Because sometimes we don't get it. Sometimes we don't get it. And God has to keep us in a season to make us get it. And we're going to be in that season until we get it. Woo. Let me say that again. We're going to be in that season until we get it. So you might as well get it. You might as well get it and move on. Get the lesson that God's trying to tell you. Make the adjustment. Make the adjustment and move on. Because if you don't move on, you're going to be taking that class. <laughs> you're going to be taking that class over and over again. Because it's about your salvation. You already prayed for your salvation. You got your salvation. And now sometimes, sometimes your spirit is not right. You got your salvation, but your spirit is not right. It's still not right. So sometimes God has to chastise us. He chastises us to get our mind and spirit in the right place. Since you got your salvation, 
Now get your spirit right and get your mind right and line yourself up with God's will and God's way to be able to be ready. Because we're already ready. We're already ready. We know the rapture can come anytime. End times can be anytime. That's right. It's just like pruning. It's just like pruning. When you cut the you cut the uh, rose, bu rose bush or other flowers, you have to cut off the bad leaves to get the rose bush to, to grow properly. All, of, all you guys who grow plants understand that. When you prune things, you have to cut things off. Cut away the bad stuff so the plant can grow healthy and grow nice and full. But sometimes we feel that cut. <laughs> sometimes God has to cut away stuff that we don't want to cut. Let me, say, let me say that again. Sometimes God has to cut away stuff that we don't want cut, but it must be cut. It must be cut for you to be able to go on. He must cut away some of those habits, the old, the old ways you keep trying to hold on to, old thoughts that keep you in prison, the old things you, you refuse to let go. God cuts it away, and you feel it. You feel it, but you got to cut it. In order for you to go on with your life, in order to go on with your life, it has to be cut. If you have trouble, let it go. If you have trouble, let it go. At some point, God will cut it to be able to let you be able to move on. So we know we our goal, our goal, if you keep seeing his face the most you can and the best you can, the closer you get to him, the more you're able to let him make changes in your life. Because you know, you know that everything he does is for our best interest. Everything God does is for our good. Even before we understand how good it's supposed to be for us. But we must be able to take the adjustment, make the adjustment, hold your peace, and then receive it. Hold your peace and receive it because God's in charge. It, even if you don't like it, God's in charge. <laughs> so you might as well trust. We say it all the time. I must trust and lean not to my own understanding because your own understanding is what keeps you coming back, keeps the confusion, keeps the regret, keeps the guilt. Your own understanding doesn't want to let go. But when you trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, what are you doing? You're letting it go. You let it go because you trust him. The perfect peace. We talk, I was keeping a perfect peace whose mind is what? Whose mind is stayed on him because we trust. It's all about trust. If you can't let go, you're having a trust issue with trusting God to make you let go. It's almost as if you're scared to let go because you're not sure what's going to happen. But if you know God's in control, if you know that God's got this, if you let go, God's got you. God's going to catch you. God's there right there waiting for you to drop into his hands for him to carry you through the storm, to help you heal. He heals the brokenhearted. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. All those scriptures is telling us that when you let go, God's got you. Don't fear. Have no fear. Don't fear letting go. Don't fear letting go because God is waiting to give you peace beyond understanding. See, all these scriptures we hold on to, they all come together right there. They all come together. When you let go and the peace of God, we always talk about the peace of God will guard your hearts and mind, but you got to let go. You got to give it to him. Be anxious for nothing. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 Philippians 4, now these aren't texts, these are scriptures. I'll give a text in just a minute. These are, Holy Spirit just giving us a reminder of all the scriptures we say all the time that is telling us how to relate to all these things that sometimes when God prunes us, you let go because you trust him. And all the scriptures we always talk about and the peace of God, hold your peace. Have no fear, stand still. We, we trust because we, we hold our peace because we trust him. All those scriptures are telling us when you're going through something and you let it go, you do not fear. You do not fear letting it go. And see, sometimes these are also ways when God has to give you attention, when God has to get your attention, 
Because if, you, if you're refusing to let go, if you're refusing to obey, even though you, you, you receive him as your Lord and Savior, and you refuse to obey the Holy Spirit, or you choose to keep walking in sin, guess what? A chastisement is coming, and a judgment is coming. Because the flesh, the flesh doesn't want to change. The flesh wants the world. The flesh wants the world. The spirit wants God. But whichever one you're feeding is what you give into. Whatever you give into is what you're feeding. You Too much flesh, you give into the flesh. Too much word, you give into the word. We want to have too much word. We want to have too much word to keep us out of the flesh, to keep us out of the world. And sometimes when God gets your attention, when God gets your attention, he makes sure you understand why you need to be adjusted. <laughs> one person asked me, one person asked me, how do you know, how do you know if what you're going through is a test or you doing something wrong? How do you know when it's a test or disobedience? One person asked, one person asked me this. Hey, Alina. Now I told the person, you don't have to answer that. You don't have to ask me that question. If the person asked me, how do I know if it's disobedience or a test? Well, first of all, if you know you're doing everything right, you're praying, you're praising, you're standing still, and you're holding on to God's word, and you're still going through something. If you're going through something and you're doing everything right, that's a test. It tells you right there. If you, you, you follow God's will, you follow God's way, you study, you stand still, you praise, you worship, and all of a sudden you got all these struggles. You're not being punished. That's a test. And the test is, the test is, are you doing what you're preaching? Are you standing still? Are you having no fear? Stand still. Are you walking by faith, not by sight? That's, these are the questions on the test. Are you standing still? Are you panicking? Are you worrying? Or are you being anxious for nothing? See, that's the test. And if you're trusting and standing still and praising and worshiping and connecting and you're still going through something, that means that's a test. Now, if you have to ask me, well, I'm not sure if this is a test or not. If you say those phrases, I'm not sure if it's a test. That means something in your spirit is telling you, telling you, you must be doing something that's making you wonder, wonder if you're doing something wrong. The Holy Spirit will tell you, well, you know you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, you know you shouldn't be doing this. The Holy Spirit is already telling you, you shouldn't be doing that. Now, in that case, if you know you shouldn't be doing it, and you keep doing it, now you're, bringing, now you're stepping out of God's blessings because you're walking in disobedience. Usually, you already know the answer to the question. When somebody says, uh, well, I'm not sure... I'm not sure if God is mad at me. I say, well, why, why do you think God is mad at you? And then they say, well, well, I've been living this way. I've been living that way. So God's not mad at you. You're just walking on, you're walking on the wrong road. You're walking with the devil. You walked out from under God's blessings, and you're now you're walking on the devil's road where there are no blessings. There's nothing but anxiety, fear, worry, stress. All the wrong things are on the wrong road. And when you're doing your best to stay on God's road, I, I did a lesson a few years about this. I actually drew the road. If you the OG ones, twos, and threes, remember, I actually drew an illustration, the right road and the wrong road. And all the good things on the right road, even when it when you're seeing you're going through a test, you're still on the right road. Because God is still protecting you. God is still protecting you when you're in a test. On the wrong road, there are no blessings. Because you you walked away from God's blessings and you're now you're on the devil's road and there's all kind of pitfalls, all kind of stress, anxiety, fear, worry, suicide, death, all this stuff of darkness on the wrong road. And as soon as you pray, Lord, what am I doing wrong? Lord, show me. Show me what I'm doing wrong. Next thing you know, he pulls you over to the right road. <laughs> we want to be on the right road, not the wrong road. And all it takes is you call his name. Like scripture says, call me. As soon as you call his name, I need you, Jesus. I'm on the wrong road. All of a sudden, he puts you on the right road because you called him. You called him 
and he answered you. See, sometimes our pride gets in the way. Our pride, we don't want to call him. We don't, we don't want to admit we're on the wrong road. And that's when God gets your attention. That's when God gets, you to, gets your attention to let you understand you're on the wrong road. And the Holy Spirit will tell you. You get this strange feeling inside. Something's wrong. I must, I, I'm doing something wrong. Now, if you are doing something wrong, the Holy Spirit will show it to you. If you try and do your best and you're doing everything according to the word, he also tells you it's a test. Hold on. Hold on. A change is coming. Hold on. A change is coming. Don't let go of God's unchanging hand. We have no idea how long the test is. But God makes us aware. God gets your attention to make you aware of which one is it. And once you understand what's going on, you either hold your peace. If you're doing everything right, hold your peace and wait on the Lord. If you're on the wrong road, now you make the adjustment to get on the right road. That's why he gets your attention. That's why he chastises us. If you, you pray, I want, to receive, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, you said the prayer. You said the prayer of salvation. And you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then you go back and get on the wrong road. God says, let me wake this person up. Let me stop everything in their life to make them ask me, Lord, what's going on? What am I not doing right? And when he wakes you up and you ask that question, then he tells you what to do and gets you back on the right road. That's why he gets your attention to make, to chastise us, to get our spirit and our life right in line with salvation. You already got your salvation. You prayed for salvation. The struggle, the struggle is getting your life in line with the preparation for self, salvation. You already got your salvation, but you're not walking his will. And walk in his way. Now, the text for this lesson we've done many times. Uh, the first one is, is James 1. James 1, 14 and 15. James 1, 14 and 15. That's the first text. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. The death could be many ways. It could be death of your connection with the Lord. Physical death. Your spiritual peace of mind. When you give in to sin and you actually accomplish it, if you don't repent right after, all of a sudden you all this disconnection is happening. All these disconnections are happening if you don't repent. See, don't ever feel too too guilty to repent. If you know you did something wrong, Lord, please forgive me. I've sinned. Lord, please forgive me. The Lord, the Lord knows we're not perfect. The Lord knows we're not perfect. So if you do something wrong, don't feel guilty. Repent, Lord, please forgive me. Give me strength to not do that again. Lord, give me strength. I made a mistake, Lord. Help me be stronger. Pray for strength. Pray for focus. If you're weak in the word or you're weak in your walk and you keep slipping, Lord, please give me strength, Lord. Give me supernatural strength to be able to walk in your will, to stay in your will. Give me strength, Lord, to stay focused. Whatever the challenge is, pray for the strength. Pray for the strength to make it through it. And his word gives us all the scriptures and the promises to hold on to. Amen. The second scripture, uh, Ephesians. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 1 through 11. Ephesians 5, 1 through 11. Now, Deanne, don't try to type all, Deanne, don't try to type all 11 verses. <laughs> the only one, uh, Deanne, if you type, is uh, verse 1. We're going to read, I'm going to read all 11. But uh, for Dan's purpose, the only one I want to write down is Ephesians 5, 1. Ephesians 5. My subtitle, my subtitle is Be, be Imitators of Christ. So Dan put verse 1 and 2. Dan, verse 1 and 2. I'm going to read 1 through 11. 
Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you, and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immortality, or impurity, or greed, must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. And therefore there must be no filthiness, no silly talk, no coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for the, for the cause of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not, look at verse 7, highlight verse 7, therefore, do not, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly dark, and now you're in the light. You walk as children, walk as children of the light. That's our mission, to walk as children of the light. For the, verse 9, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. That's also our goal, to keep on learning what we need to do to please God, not the world. We're here to please God, not please the world. Verse 11, do not, there it is again, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. Now, it goes on to say that even when we don't walk in the sin, now we never judge anyone. Let me make this clear. We never judge anyone. So a lot of times when you're trying to share someone who's living in sin and you know they're living in sin, you don't go up to them and say, how come you live in sin? You live in sin. Don't you understand that? No. That's attacking someone. <laughs> we don't attack someone. When you see someone living in sin, you come, you come with a humble heart. And, you, and you, you might say something like this. You know, man, you know, back in my days, I used to live like you, man. I used to go crazy. I, I used to do these crazy things. And you know what? I learned something the hard way. God had to teach me something. See, you share your testimony. Even though you know they're walking in sin. Amen, John. Don't preach. Don't preach. Teach. Don't preach. Teach. If you preach them, you make them feel like they're you make them feel like they're inferior to you. When you teach, use your testimony. God taught me something. I used I used to do what you did. I used to do what you did. And God God had to wake me up. And then you share your testimony. And the way God woke me up, I had to do this, I had to do that. And all of a sudden my life got together. And I feel much better now. See, I'm sharing my testimony to teach someone. We don't preach them, we teach them. If you preach them, I guarantee you'll turn them off. They can't comprehend but so much. But they can comprehend your testimony and what God did for you. As soon as you do your testimony, you feel the joy in you. Because it's real testimony. It's a real testimony. And when you give your testimony, your excitement about your testimony touches them. And they say, man, I wish God could do that for me. And you say, yes, he can do it for you. And they'll, they'll hear your joy, they hear your testimony, and they'll say, man, I wish God could do that for me. And then open the door, God can do it for you. Let me tell you what he did for me. Again, you're teaching. You're teaching, amen, Dan? You're teaching from love. You're teaching because you care. People know if you care or not. Let me say it again. People know if you care or not. You're taking the time to share. That shows you care. When you share, it shows them you care. If they, th if they think you don't care, you'll never be able to share. Oh, we should write these two down. <laughs> if they think you don't care, you'll never be able to share. If they think you don't care, you'll never be able to share. Your love is what they feel. If they feel your love, they know you care, and then you'll be able to share. You see, you see how they're connected? You see how they're connected? When you approach them with love, that's the key. Amen. 
the last the last text I, I, I'm giving I give you these three texts because I'm going to tie them together in a minute about how God wakes you up. Turn to Romans. Romans, let's see, where we want to start. Romans 7. Romans chapter 7. Now we've covered in different lessons these different verses. And that's why I think the Holy Spirit wanted me to do this lesson to put all these scriptures in the same lesson. So when you understand what you're working on and what God gets your attention, you're understanding why God is getting your attention. And, and, the, and the battle, the battle is in our flesh. The reason none of this is easy, the reason none of this is easy is because the flesh is battling us all day long. You're trying to walk with the Lord and your flesh keeps craving things in the world. And that's why we fast and pray. Sometimes we have to fast and pray to get things back in order. When your flesh is craving more than you're seeking God, you have to fast and pray. That means you need to increase God time and decrease the flesh time. The things you're doing in the world must decrease and increase. And then increase that it, it, to get that balance back. And all those are fasting and praying lessons. I, I, all my fasting and praying lessons are talking about getting the flesh under control. And that's how you know when it's time to praise or when to fast and pray. If your flesh is out of control, craving things in the world, it's fast and pray time. It means the world is winning the battle and you're giving less time to God and more time to the world. We want to give more time to God and less time to the world. To be able to keep your balance, it's all about balance. And when you feel imbalanced, you feel it in your spirit. Something's not right. I, I don't feel peace. I feel unstable. When you feel unstable, it's because the world is interrupting your peace and your balance is getting off. When you balance and the word is, is stronger, you keep the world under your feet. If the world rises up, it throws you off balance because the world is rising up. What happens? The world is rising up. What's happening on the other part of my arm? And the spirit is getting weaker. Increase the word the other way. And now what? Now the world is weaker and the spirit is stronger. Hey, woman of God. So we're working on the balance. Amen. Romans 7. We're going to start at verse, uh, verse 14. 714. Going from now again, Dan, <laughs> Dan, you're not trying to do all the verses. Uh, I'm re I'm reading seven fourteen. <clears throat> again, Dan, do just verses fourteen fifteen. Dan, everybody else, oh, highlight the verses I'm reading. The conflict. My Bible says the conflict of two natures. The conflict of two natures. Verse fourteen. We we'll go. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am a flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I do not practice, but I am not practicing what I would like to do. But I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing that I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing so no longer, verse 17, so now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the, the willing is present in me, but the doing is not. Look at that verse. The willing, the willing to live for the Lord, the willing is in me. Is present in me, but the doing, the doing of the good is not. See, sometimes let me stop right there for a minute. You know the word of God, and that's that's the willing, the willingness to do the word of God is in you. But then, but it says, but the doing it is not. You know the will of God. We know what we should be doing, but the flesh 
is trying to keep you from doing it. That's the battle right there. That verse is the battle. The willingness is present in me, but the doing of the word, the doing of the word is not. That's what we fight every day. Continue. Verse 19. For the good that I want to, for the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want to do. Verse 20. But I, but if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it. But the sin which dwells in me. I find then, verse 21, I find then the principle that evil is present in me. The one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war. Here it is. Here's right here. I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members, my flesh. Wretched man that I am. Who will seek me? Who will set me free from the body of this death? Verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, so then, so then, on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. Now, that those verses are explaining why God has to get our attention sometimes. The flesh is always fighting us. The flesh is always fighting. You're trying your best to walk in God's will and God's way. And this, this verse is showing the, the willingness, the willingness to do the word is in me. But the doing of the word is not. That's the battle right there. That's the battle in that verse. You know we, we know how we should walk. We know what the word says about living for the Lord. We know this. We read it. But the doing part, the doing the word and applying the word is where the battle comes. Because the flesh doesn't want to do the word. The flesh doesn't want to do the word. The flesh wants the things in this world. And that's why it sounds so easy. And that's why it's not easy. It's hard. Because to keep your mind stayed on him, to keep your mind stayed on Lord in the middle of this battle, that's the struggle. To keep your mind stayed on him is the struggle and the battle. Now, I'm sharing all these scriptures. These are long scriptures, but I, I still, even though I read these scriptures live, I still want you to go through and read them on your own again. Because whenever, whenever... Whenever you feel these things are in you and you just have to just convict yourself. There's, there's no hypocritical thing. It's convict yourself. If you feel that way, the Holy Spirit is convicting you. The Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit has three jobs. First, the Holy Spirit does first. It shows us right from wrong. Second, it convicts us to let us know if you're doing the right from wrong. He lets you know. I need to correct some things. And the third part is to help you repent. The, the Holy Spirit shows you. It give, he gives you revelation to understand right and wrong. Second, he shows you, oh man, oh man, uh, I'm, I'm not doing the right thing. I'm in the wrong place. The Holy Spirit is teaching. The Holy Spirit is teaching right from wrong, what you're doing wrong, now correct it. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's basically it. Right from wrong, are you doing right? Then correct it. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing in each one of us. To show us it. To show us what right and right and wrong is. And then to give you a self-evaluation. Are, are you doing this? Are you in line with the word? Are you living the word of God? Or are you living the world? What are you doing? The Holy Spirit is telling you. That the reason you feel strange inside. Is God the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And revealing it to you. And then once you understand, oh man, I'm not walking right. Oh, I need to, I need to, I need to, I need to repent. Oh Lord, forgive me, Lord. Lord, what was I doing? Lord, what was I thinking? I repent, Lord, I repent. 
And the way God gets your attention is what brings you that revelation. Is when you're walking the wrong way, in the wrong place, believe the wrong thing, following the wrong people. When you're in the wrong area, the Holy Spirit is showing you you're in the wrong place. And you feel strange. The reason you feel strange is because your spirit knows it. The, the flesh is trying to pull you into the world. And your spirit is trying to pull you back. But if you don't feed the spirit, if you don't feed the spirit, then get this clear. If you don't feed your spirit, you will not have the strength to pull yourself back to the word. If you don't feed your spirit, you will not have enough strength to pull back to the word. The word, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is Christ who gives you strength to come back to the right road. He gives you strength to make a change through Christ. If you don't feed the spirit, it feeds the world. If you don't feed the spirit, you are feeding the world and the world will pull you down. The world will take you out. And, and, and whatever you struggle with, whatever the struggle is, give it to the Lord. The first thing, no matter what the struggle is, no matter what the addiction is, no matter what the challenge is, give it to the Lord. Lord, I need you right now, Lord. I need supernatural strength. Show me what to do, Lord. Give me strength to be strong, to do what I'm supposed to do. See, you may already know what to do. The problem is you don't have the strength to do it. Let me say that again. If you're dealing with something right now, if you're struggling with something right now, you may already know what needs to be done. The problem is you are not doing it. That's the prayer right there. The prayer is, the prayer is, Lord, give me strength to do what I'm supposed to do. That's the battle. Amen. That's the battle to do what you're supposed to do. Amen. So it's, it's not, it's not a, uh, don't convict yourself. This is a learning process. This is a learning process. Don't convict yourself. Do not convict yourself. Repent. Lord, forgive me, Lord. I I need strength, Lord. I keep slipping, Lord. I'm doing my best, Lord. Help me stay stronger. See, these are times you pray. When you feel out of control, you feel like you don't have the strength to do right. Lord, I need you right now. Lord, I need you, Lord. Give me strength to be strong. You pray for the strength. You pray for the strength of what you're supposed to do. You, you, the flesh doesn't want to do it. Let me, I keep saying it. The flesh doesn't want to do it. And the only way you can be victorious, the only way you can get it done is to do it one step at a time. One step at a time. One step further toward the word is one less step in the world. Woo. Let me say it again. One closer step to the word is one step less in the world. I don't care if it's one step at a time. Guess what? One step at a time is victory. One step at a time away from the world is one step in victory to the word. You can't do it all at once. You cannot do it all at once. In a major stronghold, you cannot do it all at once. So get the victory one step at a time. One step at a time. A victory at a time. And guess what? Next thing you know, you're in complete victory, total victory. We see it all the time. One, once you're in total victory, cause you one step at a time. One step, one step, one step, one step, one step. Guess what? You're not where you used to be. After ten steps, you are not where you used to be. And that's the that's the that's sometimes we make the mistake. We want to take 20 steps at one time. You can't take 20 steps at one time. One step at a time. You get overwhelmed trying to do 20 steps, 30 steps at one time. You can't do it. One step at a time. One victory at a time. One praise at a time. And next thing you know, you're walking in what? Total victory. So that's what we got to do. These are things we got to do. Now, when God gets your attention... When God gets your attention through the Holy Spirit, that's what the Holy Spirit is telling you. Now you know now you know what's right from wrong. You know what's right from wrong. What are you doing? Where are you? Now, now the Holy Spirit has revealed right from wrong. Where is your walk right now? Where is your walk right now? If the Holy Spirit tells you you need to correct some things, don't convict yourself. Just work in correcting it. Don't convict yourself. 
The Holy Spirit says, if the Holy Spirit says, you're not walking the walk. You're not walking the walk. No, can't lose it. Can't lose the salvation. No, Sarah. You cannot lose your salvation. This is when God gets your attention. This is when God gets your attention. You already got your salvation intact. God is chastising you. God is now correcting you to get you in the right place. See, like the word says, uh, like Jesus said, I will not let anyone snatch you out of my hand. So once we get your salvation, Jesus said, I will not let anyone snatch you out of my hand. Now, and that also means you must be chastised while you're in his hand. You got your salvation. We got to get the spirit right. Get your spirit right. Get your life right. Get your life in line with salvation. See, you're not, you didn't lose it. You didn't lose it. God is now chastising you. He's pruning you to get your spirit right, to get you in the right place of praise and worship and love the way we should be while we battle the world from day to day. So that's why he gets your attention, to make you aware of what needs to be corrected. That's why he gets your attention. I mean, one of the, one of the perfect examples, one of the perfect examples, I, I, I just give you four examples, four quick examples of how we see the world, how we get wake-up calls in the world. Four perfect examples, four ways, and there's many ways. I'm just going to give you four. Four ways that God wakes you up in the world. Now, the Bible always talks about fornication. Do not fornicate. We know that fornication is a sin. And when there's a lot of people, a lot of people fornicating. And they're feeling, they're feeling well, I'm not, I got to test the waters before I get married. I got to test the waters before I get married. And, and so what happens is a lot of people fornicating. And then in the old days, STDs, sexual transmitted diseases, didn't stop people. People didn't stop. They, they just went to a the doctor. They got a shot. Didn't stop them. But then God said, let me give you a wake-up call. Let me give you AIDS to help your focus. Let me give you AIDS, a sexual transmitted disease that will kill you since you didn't stop because there was a shot. You kept fornicating because all you need to do is get an STD and go get a shot. Let me introduce something to wake you up. And then AIDS comes along, and now you get in trouble, an STD that will kill you. Oh, my gosh. Let me, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. You think? <laughs> wake-up call. See, these are wake-up calls. Wake-up calls. I mean, look at, um, look at, um, First, First Corinthians 6.18. First Corinthians 6.18. First Corinthians 618. Now I have I'll put a lot of scriptures. I'll give you a lot of scriptures under under the video so you make sure you understand. That's right, sir. Pruning, pruning, not losing, pruning. Amen. Now we know uh six eighteen reads Flee immorality. For every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man is sinning against his own body. See, when you're, when you're doing a, a, a sexual sin and, you're, and you understand that your temple, your temple is, a, is the house of the Holy Spirit to live in, when you're understanding that we don't own this body, this body is God's body, and the Holy Spirit is living inside of us. When you're walking, so when you're walking in any kind of sin, when you're walking in sin, that means you are tainting the Holy Ghost's house. Your temple is a temple for the Holy Spirit. But when you when you're walking in sin and don't even try to get things right, that means you're tainting the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit tells you, "What are you doing? What are you doing? What does word, what does word say? Uh, the word says." Uh, Oh, oh, let me get oh, let me get start saying the word. And all of a sudden you read the word. And there are other scriptures. Let me see. Um Ephesians 5:3. Ephesians 5:3. Ephesians 5:3. Now one of, I actually said that when it says we, we we covered that when I read the whole thing. Immorality, impurity, or greed must not be even named among you as is proper among the saints. If you know that fornication is a sin, 
then the, you, you should not, it says do not partake. We read it earlier. Do not partake in these things. But these are all the, the flesh. And the God has to wake you up to, to show us how we should be walking. Uh, the second one, number two, adultery. Adultery is the same thing. Adultery is also another way of not walking right in God's will. And the devil uses both fornication and adultery to pull a lot of people down. If you look at the news, how many people have fallen victim to adultery? In big high places, adultery got people. And what is adultery? Adultery, of course, is a marriage outside, sex outside of marriage. Now, I saw, I saw a term, single adultery, is when one couple is married, having a relationship with a single person. Double, double adultery is when two married couples are having sex with each other outside of marriage. When both both married couples are having sex with each other and not their own spouse, double adultery is when it's two married couples involved. Single adultery is when one person's single and is having an affair with someone married. Either way, either way, they're both against the will of God. And so Hebrews, you can write down Hebrews 13, 4, for both part 1 and 2. Hebrews 13, 4. You can put down Hebrews 34 for both number one and number two. Hebrews 13.4. Marriage is to be held in honor among all. And the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Highlight that, highlight that verse. You may run across people who don't understand. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? I got to test the waters. I got to fornicate to test the waters before I get married. Oh, well, no, it's just a relationship, adultery. Or oh, just, I, we're just friends. I, I'm just seeing this person's husband or wife, but we're not doing anything. I'm just, I'm just spending time with them because they need to talk. They, they need to be talking to their own spouse. But what does it say? Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed to be undefiled. The marriage bed is just for the spouses, not for outside relationship. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. I never want to be on the list of God judging. I don't know about you, but I do not want to be on God's list of being judged. <laughs> so uh, I'm doing my best. Well, I'm doing my best to walk in his will, walk in his way. Hey, that's the, that's the reason we keep doing what we do, to stay in his will. Number three, division. The spirit of division. Matthew 12, 25. Matthew 12, 25. Matthew 12, 25. Now, we talked about this before. The spirit of division, the spirit of division is alive and well. We got political division, racial division, economical division, age division. We got division right now going on in this world in so many ways. Of course, the higher up the division is, the more problems you have. You got countries in, in the political division. You got peace versus violence. You, I mean, we see division all over the place. It was Matthew 12, 25. Let's see. Well, uh, Matthew 12, 25. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, any kingdom, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And any city or house divided against itself will not stand. Relationship division, gender division, that's right, all kinds of division. But it said, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And any city or house divided against itself will not stand. That's why we pray for unity. We pray for us to come together, whether it's the country, the po po politically, uh, emotionally, all the division going on. We pray for all kinds of unity to bring us together.
together as one. As long as the spirit of division is alive and well, we're going to keep having problems. And some people are refusing to walk in unity. Some people are refusing to walk in love and rather walk in hate. So as long as you have people walking in hate and refusing to love, that is what the problem is. The people who are walking in hate, who refuse to walk in love, that keeps division, that feeds division. And the devil uses it. The devil uses division. Now, when, he, when God wakes us up, he tries to wake us up to say, well, you know, if you change your ways of thinking, things get better. But some people refuse to listen to the Holy Spirit. Some people don't have the Holy Spirit. First of all, first of all, many people don't have the Holy Spirit because they refuse to receive Christ, to be able to hear the Holy Spirit to tell you how to get your peace, how to walk in love, how to stop walking in hate. And because the devil's got so many people hogtied, following the wrong road, 100%. So the one way God gets our attention in division is making you aware of it that some of the problems you're having is because the way you're thinking right now is wrong. You, if you're thinking, if you're thinking as a bigot, or you're thinking as a racist, or you're thinking as of 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 of, of, of judgment, judgmental views because of differences, the Holy Spirit says, you know, you, you got your, your mind is not right. Your mind is divided right now. Your mind is not love. Your mind is not peace because you're you caught up in the world and the world is division see the, the holy spirit reveals this stuff to you by telling you your mindset needs to change that's how you get your attention mentally to let you know to let you know your mindset is in the wrong place and the, whatever he does to get your attention that's what you understand he gets your attention because you're not you're not getting it and he does something in your life to make you go, man, Lord, what, what am I not doing? See, once you say, Lord, what am I doing wrong? Lord, what's going on? Now you're ready to listen. Now you're ready to listen. If something in your life right now is going some way, and you've said this phrase, Lord, what am I not doing right? Lord, what's going on? Think of my, my life is crazy, Lord. What's going on? Now you're ready to listen. The reason you're asking that question is because the Holy Spirit has planted it in you to make you understand something needs to be corrected. Some adjustment needs to be made in your life. And so that's how he speaks to us to, in, 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 in a wake-up calls. And, and last one, the last one, immoral behavior. The last one, immoral behavior. And we read about that, about the impurity, immoral, immorality, we, the wrong behavior. When you're in the wrong behavior, wrong lifestyle, wrong whatever it is that's against the word of God, you will feel it in the spirit. If you're trying to walk God's will and your behavior is against God's will, you will feel it because the Holy Spirit will tell you in a feeling, if a feeling, something's not right, something's not right, you feel it when you're not walking in God's will. When you understand that your behavior is out of line, it's not in love, you're not walking in love, you're walking in hate, you're not walking in peace, you're walking in violence. And, and, and the Holy Spirit will reveal to you through a feeling, through a voice, you, I, you, your mind is, your, again, your mind is not right. You need to change, like, like the song we sing every day, we sing it every week, you got to change your life. You got to lay it all online, change your life, and get serious this time. We sing it every week. You got to change your life, lay it all online, change your life, and get serious this time. Give it to Lord. Whatever that wake-up call is, whatever that wake-up call is, God is placed in your life. And, uh, and, and give, me a, give me a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up if you've asked that question. Has something happened in your life where well, you've had to say, Lord, what's going on? What am I doing? What's going? Do I need to adjust something, Lord? Have I, have I done something wrong? Lord, show me. Show me, Lord. Show me what I need to do. See, if you've ever asked that question, it means the Holy Spirit is talking to you. And whatever that feeling is, you seek the Holy Spirit. Show me. Show me, Lord. Reveal like, like the, 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 the Psalm 5110. Psalm 5110. Create in me, O Lord, a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart. Lord, show me what am I doing right. Show me 
Show me what darkness is in me. Show me what misbehavior is in me. Show me, Lord, create in me a, a clean heart. Psalm 5110. So when you ask the Lord to create a new, a clean heart, he'll show you. He'll show you what needs to change. He'll show you what adjustment needs to be made. Because you're asking him, Lord, create in me a clean heart. And you always hear me say at the end of, I say everything, and Lord, remove anything in me. Remove anything in me that is not like you. That's a that's a the, a prayer I add to the verse, the scripture. Let, let me read the whole whole scripture. Turn to turn to Psalm fifty one ten right quick. Psalm fifty one ten, and then I always add and remove anything from me that is not like you. That's a part of a prayer I made to go with that verse. Fifty one ten. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew, renew a steadfast spirit within me. It was a steadfast spirit, a spirit connected to the Lord, a spirit doing his best to live in his will and his way. Create in me a clean heart and renew in me. Renew a steadfast spirit. See, when you say that every day, and we need to, we need to say it every day, because we're under attack every day, and something in the world is always trying to jump on you every day. So it's good to say it's good to say that every day, every morning, every night. Lord, create in me a clean heart, and renew, renew more, renew my spirit, Lord. Give me a freshness, a fresh connection, a fresh anointing to be able to walk in this day. See, when you say that every morning, it doesn't matter. Because when you say that every morning, he says, renew. When you renew something, that means something was trying to take away. Renew. Refresh me, Lord. Refresh my spirit. Yesterday was hard. Yesterday had some struggles. But Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit, which means he refreshes you. He knows you had a bad day yesterday. He knows if you slipped yesterday. He knows that you had some rough time yesterday. But renew, Lord. Renew a steadfast spirit. Renew me to be on fire for you and praising and worship. Create a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit. So when you say that every day, you are refreshing your spirit every day in prayer. And then I always add, and remove anything in me that is not like you. I add that to that verse for me. Lord, if there's anything in me, remove anything in me that is not like you. As you create this clean heart, when he's creating clean heart, when he is creating the clean heart, he is removing what doesn't need to be there. In order to create a clean heart, God has to remove what is not clean in there to make it a clean heart. So if you say this scripture every day, every day, and as God gets your attention, it will help you, help you get into the area of the peace of mind that you seek to be able to walk in his will the way you should be. And, and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for getting my attention to make me see that I was on the wrong road. Thank you, Lord, for showing me, Lord, and revealing to me what needs to be adjusted. Thank you, Lord, for opening my eyes, Lord, to make me understand I was walking on the wrong road. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving me. And we see it every day. Thank you, Lord, for saving me from all my hurt and pain. Thank you, Lord, so I can live again. I thank you, Lord, for all you brought me through. Oh, Lord, I'm in love with you. Renew a fresh spirit, renew a steadfast spirit. And as we do this every day, and whenever God gets your attention about whatever it is, listen. God is getting your attention for a reason, to listen and adjust. That's why he's waking you up. He gives you a wake-up call to get your attention, to listen, adjust, and repent if you have to. But the main reason he gets your attention is to let you know 
something needs to change to get you in line with his will and his way. Amen. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this lesson, Lord. We thank you for this lesson, Lord, that we'll be able to walk in victory, Lord, to be able to walk in love, to walk in obedience, to walk the way you want us to walk, Lord. Bless every fellowship member right now, Lord. And we seek your face every day to be able to get closer to you, Lord, to be able to get closer to you and closer in our walk, to seek your face every day, to commit to ask for it, create a clean heart every day, Lord. As we walk in this world, Lord, we understand that we face challenges in the world, Lord. We understand we face all kinds of of worldly challenges, Lord. Bless every fellowship member right now, Lord, with supernatural focus, supernatural anointing to walk in their anointing, to walk in obedience, to keep seeing your face, to get closer and closer to your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We sing it every week. Walk in his will. Walk in his way. Jesus Christ is the only way. And when you're not walking that what when you're not walking that walk, God will get your attention to make you understand what needs to change to put you in line. With walking his will and walking his way. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. All have fallen short. We are all works in progress. Look at it, look at it that way. We are all works in progress. And we seek to do the best we can one step at a time, one day at a time, one victory at a time, step by step. Get closer and closer to walk in his will and walk in his way. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Before we close, as always, before we close, I always know someone is visiting, watching, or listening who doesn't understand our fellowship, our praise, our worship, our worldwide fellowship. Someone's watching right now. Who doesn't understand because right now their life is falling apart. So right now I'm going into closing prayers and the prayer of salvation. As always, please, please, no typing until after the closing prayers. Anything typed during the closing prayers is deleted. I respect for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right now I'm talking to the person listening. I'm talking to someone listening right now or watching. You've been here the whole time. And you heard the praise and the worship and the sermon. But right now you can't focus because right now your life is falling apart. Worry, fear, stress, anxiety is all over you. Families turned away from you. Friends stabbed you in the back. And you may even feel like giving up right now. Yet somehow you find yourself on this channel. Have no idea how you got here. And that's because God brought you here. You're not here by accident. God brought you here because he sees what you're going through right now, physically, spiritually, or emotionally. You may be here as a backslider in guilt. For whatever reason, you chose to leave God and go back into a life of sin. And now your life is falling apart because you went back into the devil's world. And now the devil is telling you, once you leave God or fail God, you can never go back. And that right there is a lie from the pit of hell. No one is perfect. All have fallen short. So if you said the prayer of salvation and you fell back into a life of sin, there is nothing the devil can do to take away your salvation. Just rededicate your life. Recommit your life to Christ. And there's nothing the devil can do to stop you. So whether you're walking as a backslider, you want to come back to the Lord, 
or right now you're walking in hopelessness and depression and worry and fear, or you just don't know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, pray with me right now. Repeat after me. Father God, forgive me for the wrong I've done and the wrong I've been. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for me my sins and was raised from the dead. I want Jesus to be Lord and Savior of my life. And I commit right now, I will not do a single thing in life or make a single decision in life without living up to you first. Create in me, O oh Lord, a clean heart and remove from me anything and everything that's not like you. In Jesus' name. And if you said that prayer sincerely, your spirit is not right to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a part of God that lives inside of us, that teaches us, that guides us, and also convict us when you're not one God's will. The Holy Spirit will show you people, activities, and things you're doing right now in your life, which is bringing darkness into your life. And then he'll tell you exactly what you need to do to reverse it. First of all, spend time with God every day. Feed your spirit. Starve your flesh. Feed your faith. Starve your doubt every day. And the more time you spend with God every day, the more peace of mind you'll feel in your life. Which is God letting you know it's going to be all right. God's got this. God's got you. Right now, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we as a fellowship rebuke and bind the spiritual retribution, revenge, retaliation, backlash, and every other demonic spirit, name it unnamed, seen or unseen, who may try to attack anyone in this fellowship because of their participation in this fellowship. We cast all you demonic spirits out of our mind, out of our spirit out of our home, out of our kids, back to the pit of hell from which they came. In Jesus' name. And Father God, loose, Lord. Loose into the fellowship, unspeakable joy. Loose peace beyond understanding. Loose restoration, Lord. Restore every area of our life. Loose reconciliation, Lord. Bring reconciliation to marriages and families right now who are falling apart because of the devil's attack, Lord. And Lord, please keep a hedge of protection over all the families and marriages who are not falling apart, but who the devil is still attacking every day, Lord. Loose supernatural healing, physical healing, spiritual healing, emotional healing. By your stripes we healed. And now we know, Lord, now we know every day, Lord, every day, we take the time to confess it, to see it emotionally, spiritually, physically. See your healing. See it. Believe it. Receive it in your heart and expect it. Pray as if your life depends on it. P-U-S-H. Pray until something happens. Loose. Supernatural overflow. Financial breakthrough. Supernatural debt cancellation. Lord, let your blessing, Lord, the blessings of abundance rain down, Lord. Rain down. On the fellowship to air financial need, whatever it is, Lord. For you should supply all our need according to your riches in glory. But Christ Jesus, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want for anything when the Lord is my shepherd. For we're the head and not the tail. We're above and not beneath. We're the lender and not the borrower. We're blessed going in and blessed going out. We're blessed that we may be a blessing to others. We are out of debt. All of it is met. We have plenty more to put in store. We are children of God, and nothing shall by any means hurt us about our blessings in any way. And finally, Lord, we thank you for a miracle, Lord. Each person here has a miracle they're praying for right now. And now we know, Lord, now we know every day. Every day we take the time to see it. Visualize your miracle. See it every day. See it, believe it, and receive it in your heart. And as you receive it into your heart, expect it. Expect 
your miracle every day. We don't know the when. We'll never know the exact when. But because we don't know when, that means any day you wake up could be the day of the manifestation of the miracle you're praying for right now. So expect it every day. May the Lord bless you and keep you, family. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his face of divine approval upon you and give you peace. That you may be a blessing to everyone you touch and speak to, a blessing to everyone you pray over, a blessing to everyone you pass by and bless with our open mouth because the love and light of the Lord is all over you 24 7, 365, including the year. So, Father God, all these things we ask, Lord, all these things we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. The fellowship say, Amen. Amen. Amen.